JJ Walsh, your host in Hiroshima, Japan. And today, also in Hiroshima, Japan, Simono Zolet. Thank you so much for joining today. Hello, good morning, and thank you for having me. It's wonderful to have you. Now, yesterday, we talked to your wonderful husband, uh, Mo san, and you guys are both doing such interesting projects about rural revitalization. You are focused um, a little bit more on regenerative farming. Yeah. And you also do interesting programs in Italy as well as in Japan. So we're going to be talking about lots of those great topics. And I do want to mention that you are one of the speakers at our wonderful event on Saturday yeah. in Mitarai. So I'm really excited to have you there. And it's so fun to talk a little bit about what you're going to be talking about today. Great. I'm really looking forward for the event. Wonderful. Uh, before we dive into some of your topics in Japan, can you give us a little bit of background about how you got interested in researching these topics? Yeah, so I'm originally from Italy and I did my um, basically my bachelor and master's degree in at Venice University in Italy. And at that time I was doing studying environmental science. And then I did a master's degree in sust international sustainable development. And through that master's degree, I had the chance to go to Japan to actually come to Hiroshima University for six months because it was um, sort of exchange program between uh, international universities. And again, at that time, I was more on the like environmental science side of things and sustainable development, climate change, this kind of basically global issues. And then um, I decided again to come back to Japan later on because uh, I met my future husband, Mo, that you had on your program yesterday. And I also shifted my research a little bit. Um, I started a new master um, in Japan under the Tawiyaka program here at Hiroshima University. And rather than focusing on purely on environmental issues, I shifted more towards um, rural sociology aspects and specifically the sociology of agriculture and food. Because basically I'm from a very rural areas in the northeast of Italy. I'm from a small village in the Italian Alps. So, and it's a very rural areas and agriculture is what basically shaped the local landscape. And again, I realized when I was living in Italy that um, in rural areas, local agriculture is declining, especially areas that are more marginal, like mountainous areas. And that uh, sustainable farming, organic farming, was not only a solution to many of the climate and like environmental issues that we are seeing in the world today, but can also be a solution for revitalizing rural areas. So that's why I started my research in Japan with the idea of doing a sort of comparative research between the two countries, Italy and Japan, around the topic of sustainable, organic, regenerative agriculture and rural development or rural revitalization, if you want. That's so interesting. I would love to talk someday, maybe not today, about Venice and over tourism, because Venice is one of the key examples of how you can try certain things to curb the number of crowds that come at the same time in such a small area. And I think there's such a lot of parallels and, and insights that we could learn from for crowded areas um, tourism in Japan, including Miyajima, which is in our backyard, right? Um, but I have this photo uh, of rural uh, areas in Italy that you sent, absolutely beautiful. And uh, this is diversified farming. And I noticed so many interesting uh, similarities with what you see in farming in Japan. Um, they're also using the plastic cover to keep the weeds down. Um, but one really nice aspect, which I was happy to see, is using different uh, agriculture in the same area. It's not a monocrop. And like Thomas Kleffer, who I know you know as well, in yeah. Hiroshima is trying to do, is to use a trees as well as a part of the agriculture system because of climate change and it's getting hotter and hotter. 
Are you seeing this not only in Italy or Europe, but are you seeing this around Japan as well, using more diversified systems? Well, if we look at organic farmers in Japan, historically, since the beginning of the organic farming movement back in the 60s, um, organic farmers have been like very diversified in their approach to farming, right? So basically the way the organic farming began in Japan was with this small scale, very diversified farming, right? Because um, from the beginning, organic farming in Japan was already a sort of partnership between um, consumers who were interested in having healthy, safe, and environmentally friendly food and farmers who wanted to grow this kind of food. So we have, for example, the famous Teikei movement in Japan, which is the, was the inspiration for the CSAs that we have now in the USA, in Europe. And so from the beginning, farmers, organic farmers were trying to grow a high variety of crops so they could provide their consumers, the people who were get, buying their product with a diversified um, array, uh, array of products and of vegetables that they could eat, eat all year round. So, and so, and if you like, if you visit organic, small scale, especially organic farmers today in Japan, you still see this model. You still you see them growing a huge variety of vegetables throughout the the year. They have rice. They have many different vegetables. Many of them sell their products through the like the vegetable box model. So yeah, that definitely diversification and diversified crops is. Um, kind of key aspect of organic farming. And it's a bit sad to see that in many parts of the world, including Italy sometimes, as organic farming becomes more mainstream, let's say, we also see a sort of organic becoming more industrial and less diversified. So more similar to industrial farming than to small scale diversified farming. Yeah, that's a really interesting thing. One of the other speakers on Saturday's event uh, now Fukuoka-san, who does Imi Abi Farms mm -hmm. in Aki Takeda area of Hiroshima. And she does a lot of farming workshops. And she says one of the most interesting questions is, can you grow food without pesticides, without fertilizer? Is it, is it possible? Like there is just a very basic awareness gap, I think, in Japan that organic farming is even possible. Have you mm -hmm. found that in a lot of your research? Oh yeah, definitely. Like speaking to organic farmers in Japan, I often get told that the farmers surrounding them, the conventional farmers are very skeptical, especially at the beginning about whether farming without pesticides and without chemical fertilizer is actually possible. And that's because not just because like, farmer like conventional farmers are used to you to these products but also because the climate in japan is a bit difficult in the sense that many areas are, have sort of have this humid almost subtropical climate so pests outbreaks are very common and then you have weeds growing like crazy so conventional farmers definitely have this sort of resistance towards organic at the beginning which is a bit like kind of sad considering that until 50 years ago all farm farming was organic farming basically well maybe more than 50 years but at the beginning we were all farmers were doing basically organic and it was still possible to grow food in abundance so interesting um there was also other interesting photos of of the tools um that they're using in italy and i've seen thomas use similar types of tools um, no, no till like just aerating the, the fields and putting seeds in. Uh, tell us about this program that you've got coming up next year, is it in Italy? It's this summer actually in July. Yeah, can you tell us about it? Sounds great. So um, the program is um, actually, uh, it's called Rural Entrepreneurship Education Certificate. So it's not specifically about farming and food systems, but through this course, we are going to visit mainly um, um, farms and other like um, companies, small, small businesses, mainly small local businesses who are doing activities related to food, farming, rural tourism, rural crafts. 
So um, what we are trying to do, um, I'm a member of this uh, organization called USASB, which is the United States Small Business Association. So they are trying to establish more this field of rural entrepreneurship uh, because entrepreneurship can also be one of the solution to support rural areas, especially declining rural areas. So, and entrepreneurship, of course, around food and farming is one of the main things you can do in rural areas, although it's, of course, not the only thing. So we are trying to go into rural areas in this program, look at what small businesses are doing, what are their models, what, what kind of innovation they're introducing to um, be not just economically viable, but also to bring social and ecological value to their communities, to their areas. Great. Um, that sounds wonderful. I hope it's a great success. It's so wonderful that these programs are now possible again, that travel. Yeah. We, we know that we're going to be living with uh, coronavirus for a while, but we kind of know how we should social distance and wear masks and get vaccines. So we're starting to move forward again. Doesn't it feel like that we, we are living with coronavirus for the future? Um, it's so nice you can do these programs again. Yeah, but it's also, I mean, in a way, the coronavirus taught us maybe first that maybe we need to fly less and like move less because it's the way we have been flying around. It's basically unsustainable from an environmental point of view. And also that many online activities are possible. So many conferences have moved online and it's been quite successful. So I think probably, I hope, this has taught us that like not all traveling is necessary we can do many things online so if we can we can try to limit like our especially flying and our co2 emission yeah. of course i'm going i'm flying to italy this summer so i'm guilty but we're too, but... staying for a long time um <laughs> yeah. hopefully that idea of just popping over to another country or another area for a day and coming back hopefully people aren't doing that so much um, but that that whole concept of the coronavirus opening up ideas and and changing our mindset about how we think about our lives and work and working online is possible, right? So a lot of your research, uh, moving out to rural areas, uh, learning how to grow your own food is probably really popular and growing because of the coronavirus in many ways, right? Yeah, well, definitely we have seen um, an increase in interest around everything that relates to the rural environment. So from the possibility of growing your own food to live in a more like natural environment, less crowded, a less maybe stressful life as well. So definitely... Um, the pandemic has opened many people's mind towards the possibility of re of living in rural areas and even working in rural areas now, especially with remote work becoming easier and more accepted as well. Many people are thinking of making this move. So, and I'm really looking forward forward to what will happen in the future around this because I think things like telework and remote work are here to stay. They're not going away just because as the pandemic sort of fades out so and it's going to be interesting seeing how the how things change from now on yeah definitely and that was something that a lot of people at the minka summit uh an event to talk about how to reuse a lot of these beautiful old houses that might be run down but still have so much value in the structure that it's easy easier to remodel than to knock down of course more sustainable too and build new um but that's that's another reason that a whole idea has also been growing in demand and interest right mm -hmm. people are changing priorities yeah uh, frass has a great comment here thank you frass from youtube i would like to know more about these workshops great so i will add uh links below frass I know Thomas Klepfer in uh, Onomichi area of Hiroshima does workshops. Um, now Fukuoka in Akitakira in Hiroshima. Do you know of others, Simona, who are doing farming workshops? You were doing some with Hirodai students as well, right? 
Uh, no, the workshop with uh, the work with the Hero Dice students was a little bit different, but I mean, actually, if you ah yeah, well, that was part of the of us of our intensive course we do in the summer, which is called Rural Entrepreneurship in Practice, which is done at Hero Dai. And we visited some organic farmers do, during that course. So that's why it was not really a farming workshop. It was more about um, understanding rural entrepreneurship and different types of rural entrepreneurs, including organic farmers. But, um, but I mean, depending on, for example, your level of confidence with Japanese, there are many, like all, basically almost all the organic farmers I visited for my research we're doing some kind of at least events or workshops um, related to organic farming. So uh, you have rice planting events, you have different like vegetable planting, harvesting. Um, so that's something that or Japanese organic farmers really do a lot. And, and again, if you start searching organic farmers, in your area, you are definitely going to find like this kind of activities again. It depends on how confident you are with Japanese, for example. But even for me, when I arrived in Japan, I my Japanese was almost non-existent. And even now, it's not, I mean, I'm not fluent in Japanese. But again, farmers are usually very open to share their knowledge, to even engage with foreigners. So I encourage like everyone to seek out the farmers in their area and see what they're doing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities, I think, all around Japan. I know that Chuck Kayser in the Kyoto area also does uh, workshops and you can volunteer for a day or you can volunteer longer and learn a lot. There's the WOOF system. Oh, yeah. Right. W-W-O-O-F. And it's all a network around the world of organic farms where you can go and volunteer your services. And I believe you get free room and board, right? So yeah, food exactly. you get a place to stay. So you can sign up on the website. There's a small fee to pay just for insurance and like this kind of things. But I, when I also started my research in Japan, I used the Wolf Networks and I visited some farms through this network. I'd stayed for one week and work with them, talk to them. So it was a re and through the Wolf nef Network, you often also find farmers who can speak some English if you cannot speak Japanese. So that's a good way to get started and learn about organic farming if you want to do that in Japan. And not just Japan, you can do it all over the world. Yeah. Um, this might be a good chance to talk about Oheso because I know that Oheso has been part of your research in Seda, in Hiroshima's rural area, really famous for growing fruit and vegetables, this area. Um, and they, do you know their story? How the Oheso couple met on an organic farm when they oh, were yeah. workers in Spain or Italy? Or it was in Italy, Europe. actually. Yeah. yeah. And then they came just looking for farmland in Hiroshima and growing their own organic food. And they ended up uh, being offered the next farmhouse and that became their cafe. And they grew very organically into other buildings to have a, a, sh a workshop and a bakery. And that's a wonderful story of success. Yeah, that's definitely a great example. And I will also be mentioning them in our talk on Saturday because I think they are, you know, one ex good example of, you know, this idea of rural possibilities and the possibilities that you can have in rural areas to do things, to even innovative things or things that have a connection with the local community, with sustainability and so on. So definitely a great example. I just just found the photo. Yeah, so Oheso Cafe is also a really great example. Uh, also a wonderful place to go and eat. If you're in the Hiroshima area, you can see the cafe, which is a remodeled old farmhouse that they've renovated. I, it's a wonderful example, isn't it? Yeah, it's really great. And I need to visit again because I haven't been there for a while. And I know now they are expanding, creating a new bakery. So I'm looking forward to visit. Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, I tried to contact them recently to get some of their roles uh, for our event, but I, I left it too late. 
and I was so tempted to just get in my car and go have one of their amazing vegan pizzas as my treat. It's about an hour's drive from mm -hmm. Hiroshima City, right? Yeah. Now let's talk a little bit about the rural decline as opportunity idea. Can you give us a little bit of background about how you started focusing on this research idea? Yeah, so um, I mean, this you know idea of rural decline, like rural communities like becoming depopulated. You have aging communities where like people are getting older and older. There are young people are going out. There are no jobs available locally. Farmland is abandoned because people basically there are not enough farmers engaging in farming anymore. So. And these images of rural decline are quite pervasive. Like you go, for example, to rural Italy, to rural Japan, to rural areas across Europe and the United States, and you see very similar issues happening. And there is this sense of kind of despair and like um, there's nothing we can really do to change this situation. And I'm not saying that is this is probably going an issue that we cannot solve completely because if you just look at Japan, population as a whole is starting to decline. So we are not going to repopulate all rural communities. But at the same time, I think we need to change our perspective and start seeing, rather than focusing on the problems, starting to focus on the opportunities. As we mentioned before, especially now after the pandemic and with people in general being more aware of environmental issues, being more aware of, you know, work-life balance, all these things that kind of connect the global problems with the local and with the personal. I think there, there is going to be more opportunities for rural areas to, became, to become, again, places where people actually want to live, want to farm, want to start their own business or want even just work remotely or, you know, renovate an old house and starting living there. So there are many possibilities in the rural and that's something I would really like to focus on like rather than looking only at the negative aspects of decline and depopulation and originally i did this because i was seeing that in my home in my own like hometown like how the these small villages in italy were becoming less and less vital and less and less kind of populated so although we see these beautiful landscapes many of the houses are empty many of the farmland is not being used anymore so what can we do about this? And again, as I mentioned before, food and farming related um, business and pro businesses and projects are one of the ways in which we can engage with the rural and create something new and something more innovative. And again, I, I still believe that sustainable farming, regenerative farming, organic farming are what we should focus on, which is not um, it's not something 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 that's so uh, clear immediately. Like if you look at the policies of the Japanese government, for example, about agriculture, you see there's a lot of focus on large scale industrial farming rather than on like more small scale regenerative agriculture. And I think this is a bit of a pity because I think there's more potential. There's more potential for regenerative farming, especially when we think about the global issues we have as well, not just the local issues. Wonderful. Um, big issues, but slowly, slowly uh, starting to evolve and uh, communities interacting, uh, more people moving from the cities out to the rural areas has also been one of your focuses of research. Um, the priorities of island communities I found really interesting. So a lot of people do move out to the rural areas to have more food security, but that really wasn't one of the big uh, concerns of people moving to the island communities, according to your, your research. It was more transportation, medical services and infrastructure, employment opportunities, daily necessities, uh, being able to purchase daily things, and connectivity within the region or neighborhood. This data was so interesting, but I was surprised there wasn't anything about being able to grow your own food. Did you also notice that? 
So actually, the, the graph you showed me uh, was not about the newcomers, but it was about the a sample of local people. So people who grew up and were like living in those, had been living in those communities for a long time. And you do see a lot of this different perspective, right? You see the local people who are often mainly elderly people as well, because again, if you look at rural communities in Japan, the aging rate is very, very high. And so, of course, for them, the priorities are like medical infrastructure, transportation. They're also very concerned about, for example, you know, being able to even go to do uh, to to do the daily shopping because there are not a lot of shops or supermarkets. But and then when you look at the newcomers, um, I also had a. It's not available in that uh, paper you mentioned, but I also had a. Um, we had a small sample of newcomers and for them the highest priority was being in a natural being able to live in a natural environment being able to grow your own food be able to you know challenge new projects and ideas so you see this quite different perspective between the local people and the newcomers mm, but you know i think for example for local people they don't mention things about being able to grow their own food because for them it's so natural to be able to grow their own food. You go in all these small communities, both in the mountains of Japan, in the islands, and you see, you know, these small, beautiful, like mm, vegetable plots among the houses and um, like along the roads. And you're like, and you can understand how people that are living there, they're, for them, growing their own food is part of their life. So they probably don't even think about it. And it's the newcomers who probably come from an urban life where growing your own food is basically impossible. They give much more value to this because for them, it's something that they couldn't do before. So yeah. there's definitely a different in perspective. <laughs> for sure. And you, you mentioned that in your research. I found that really interesting. Um, the reason people wanted to move out, a lot of it was spurred on by the Fukushima disaster. Oh. And then realizing that being near natural areas was really important to their life, health, probably, right? Yeah, that was something that especially was especially clear when I interviewed newcomer organic farmers. So again, my research started focusing on these things, newcomer organic farmers. So people who were doing organic farming, but were not from a family farm, they were just new in from into the farming um, sector and also usually came from outside and started farming. And for them, like many of them were telling me, I decided to start farming after the Fukushima disaster because I realized I wanted to grow safe food for my family. I wanted to live in a natural environment. And I wonder sometimes if for Japan, Fukushima was sort of the first wave of people moving to the countryside in a relatively large numbers and then maybe the coronavirus disaster uh, the coronavirus pandemic will is going to be a sort of second wave because again people are starting to think about this kind of things more and more yeah i think so um now a lot of your your projects uh have been collaborating with the group called tobishima life it looks like for Hiroda, you did a project uh, in Tobishima Island. So it's an area of Japan and they have a very good support network called Tobishima Life. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you've been collaborating or researching with them? Sure. So this is a project we did in the past year and it's, uh, or it's, a, pro it's a project that um, is funded by Hiroshima University. There is a small grant for project that try to connect the university, the faculty members and students with local communities and local groups. And we decided to collaborate with Tobishima Life because we had a connection through Tom, Tom Miyagawa Colton that you also met in Mitarai. And what we did with that project was um, like the original idea was to design a um, so-called Iju Taiken tour. So an, um, a tour for uh, people, for aspiring newcomers to experience like life in the Tobishima Kaido Islands. So um, 
what we did was with the students, we were going uh, to the different island and interviewing the Tobishima life members, like seeing how they were living. And we were also, um, we also took some footage of their interviews and of the local landscapes. And we made, in the, and in the end, we did a small video too. And the video is sort of designed, that's the one you are seeing in the background now. It's designed to sort of, uh, replicate uh, this kind of tour. But originally our idea was to actually have a real tour. So gather people who are interested in living in this area and have them do the actual tour in, in person. But then with the coronavirus pandemic, it became quite difficult to do this in practice. So we decided to make a video instead. But again, um, after this, um, after the project ended, um, Tobishima Life did one small event, the lemon farming event that I think JJ also, you, you participated in that. So that was also part of the, this project. Um, so we, we um, Hiroshima uh, University gave some funding and then Tobishima, the Tobishima Life Network created the event. And we are hoping to continue to participate to continue um, again this year with the project, if we can get funded again. And we are probably trying going to do more events to get people to come to these islands, and probably trying also to create a sort of small community garden in Mitarai. But it's still undecided as of now. Yeah, it looks great, and uh, it's the chain of. Is it 11 islands? Is the Tomishima area? Uh, no, the Tobishima Kaido is just five islands. Actually, the last island, Okamura, is technically part of Ehime Prefecture. So it's not Hiroshima Prefecture, but from a geographical perspective, they're quite close to each other. So we, s all, we see all the five islands as a sort of chain. And it's now, we call it the Tobishima Kaido now because they also started there's also a cycling road. So it's sort of a parallel to the more famous Shimanami Kaido. And actually there's a ferry connection. So you can, like people who are really passionate about cycling can actually do the Tobishima Kaido and then the Shimanami Kaido. <laughs> so it's probably a two day cycling, but <laughs> it's probably very yeah, No, I, I noticed like that when I, when I come to Mitarai, uh, there's a lot of people who enjoy cycling that area. Yeah. It's so beautiful, right? Yeah, and definitely cycling tourism is becoming quite, quite a big thing in Japan. And I think it's great because, you know, it's a definitely more sustainable way of moving and, and like visiting places. So I hope it's going to become bigger and bigger from now on. Yeah. And it's, it's great to see uh, like Tobishima Life doing that community support of the citrus farmers. I mentioned this with the talk. Uh, with Mo yesterday, but it's amazing decline in the amount of farmers in general around Japan, but the citrus farmer numbers is really declining fast. And I know uh, when I saw you guys at the Shiosai event in Mitarai, one of your Hirodai students had taken on uh, organic citrus farming, and it was wonderful to see him selling lemonade at the <laughs> event. So it is a great way to get uh, students involved and young people to start farming and learning about the area and then maybe becoming entrepreneurs as well, right? Yeah, definitely. And since you mentioned the farmland abandonment issue, actually Hiroshima Prefecture is number one in Japan for the amount of abandoned land. I think there was a recent study that found that 20, about 27% of all farmland in Hiroshima prefecture is abandoned. So there's also, this is a big issue, but probably also a big opportunity for people who want to do farming because unlike other rural areas where farmland can be very expensive, I'm thinking about some parts of Italy, the United States, like accessing farmland for newcomers who don't have any uh, land of through their families can be really challenging. But Japan is quite different in this sense because although of course there are still some problems to find farmland, but it's definitely, it's much easier than many other places. So there's a lot of opportunities for people who are interested in farming and even doing sustainable forms of farming to find farmland. 
And yeah, I, I, I talked to, that's really shocking to hear, mm -hmm. Simona. I didn't know about that Hiroshima being the number one uh, most abandoned farmland area in Japan. That's incredible. Uh, I did talk to Thomas. I went to visit his farm. He's expanding his farmland and his uh, takeover of some of the abandoned buildings to have a workshop and cafe and place to stay. It's wonderful to see that. Uh, he described himself as the last farmer on the island, like the last samurai, right? It's crazy that that is happening. Um, but it's so wonderful that there are entrepreneurs like Thomas and so many others who are trying to use it as an opportunity, like you said. Yeah, definitely. And since you mentioned also the young citrus farmer, the our university, well, he's not a student anymore. He graduated last year, but he, now he is um, doing, a, he's working and doing an internship at a, another organic farm in, uh, I think it's in Jinseki Kogen in Hiroshima Prefecture, but also keeping his citrus farm in the island. And I think you know, also the value of the project we do with the university, trying to connect the students with local area, have this also this perspective of getting students to see the potential and possibilities of the rural. So usually our students here, you know, they live around the campus and Saijo itself is quite, is a quite urban area, although it's surrounded the, by rural areas. So students usually don't really go out and visit rural areas, think about what they could do there. And I think like through different projects we are doing and like, even uh, Mitarai Base, the place we will stay on Saturday, um, Professor Iwamoto who owns the place, she's really bringing a lot of students there and students so get to experience life in the local communities. Some of them like Tsubasa, the, the, farm, the citrus farmer you mentioned before, got interest in farming and other might be interested in doing other activities in rural areas. So there's also this connection that we're trying to create. That's wonderful. Uh, we have a great question from Kyle on YouTube. Thanks for joining Kyle. He says, uh, do you know anything about ocean farming, like seaweed cultivation around Japan? Is there any organic? So um, seaweed farming is actually not my area of expertise, so I couldn't really answer this question. But one interesting thing I saw is farmers, like organic farmers growing vegetables, actually using seaweed as fertilizer. So we had a really interesting, we visited a really interesting uh, farm in Miyajima. So most people just go to the the temple, the shrine area in Miyajima, but there's actually a backside to the island, which is almost like there are basically no villages, only a few houses. And there's a really interesting organic farm there. And uh, like the owners, the, um, the farmers um, are actually collecting seaweed from the beach in specific periods of the year and then using the seaweed as fertilizer. And it's apparently very good because it has a lot of minerals, so it's good for the vegetables and it's a uh, freely available, completely natural uh, fertilizer for uh, the farm. So it's a way to use local resources and to use like, it's a kind of natural circulation. So this, this idea in, that is quite rooted in Japanese organic farmers of the, the circulation of natural resources, like using what is available locally and use it for your farm so you don't need to buy fertilizer even you know organic fertilizers are available in the home centers to to buy but if you can use local resources which are freely available they're natural it's probably better for the environment and for your own farm also from an, an, an economic perspective not just from an environmental perspective so this example of using seaweed as fertilizer was really interesting i thought yeah, that's Nakaoka Farm. I yeah. am a subscriber of their monthly organic box. And they are a wonderful couple, young yeah. family, um, that grow beautiful vegetables. I also visited the bee farmer who was right next to their farm. And they had such a beautiful relationship between growing organic vegetables and raising bees who pollinate the vegetables so it worked really well as a, a collaborative effort um mm -hmm. the bee farmer was saying it's so difficult to find a good place to have your bee farm because 
so many of the farms are using pesticides, which will kill the bees immediately. So he was so happy to find an organic farm to be near. And you know, this is another way where I see possibilities in these declining rural communities and abandoned farmland, because if you are organic farmers in an area that is surrounded by other farms that are not organic doing intensive farming, then you're going to have a really hard time to establish your farm because when you do like organic and regenerative farming, you don't just remove the pesticides and chemical fertilizer and just you know put natural fertilizers what you do is you have to redesign your whole farm to fit more like to work with natural processes and if you are completely surrounded by farms that are not organic this is really difficult to do you get a lot of pest outbreaks because the farms around you are spraying chemicals so all the pests come to your farm this kind of issue and also you um, you probably you cannot have these synergies between the um, like the crops you're growing and maybe the farm animals like you have you can have bees but some farmers like thomas for example they also have sheep or goats that are also part of the system and this can be very challenging to do when you are surrounded by a lot of other farms who don't share your ideals and way of doing things but if you are in a place where you know, there's a lot of abandoned farmland, you don't have anybody around you, then this system is much more easy to establish, I think. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, we have a question from LinkedIn. Thank you for joining on LinkedIn, Azizi San. Uh, he's asking about bamboo. Uh, do you know of any uh, projects around Japan who are harvesting and reusing bamboo? I know the forestry system in Japan in general is underutilized, right? We we need a lot more uh, use of domestic wood so that we have demand from the customers for domestic wood. I love bamboo. Bamboo is a fantastic renewable resource. I would love to see more bamboo products from Japan because I know uh, it's a big issue as bamboo is encroaching onto people's farms and into the houses. Um, so there is a lot of need to be harvesting the bamboo and it grows so quickly too, right? Yeah, I think you kind of, that's a good answer to the question actually. So uh, I think there's a lot of potential, especially as uh, like other countries outside of Japan, like in, you in Europe, in the United States are starting to really see this product as something that is sustainable, that's that can grow easily. So, and we see like, until maybe five, six, ten years ago in Italy, I had never seen anything made of bamboo. Like it's not something you could buy or find, like like even either household products or now you even I've, I've I've seen even textiles made of bamboo. So you can <laughs> I have some like kind of undergarments made of bamboo. They're really comfortable. They're eco friendly, and you're we're starting to see in Europe these kind of products more and more. So I think there's going to be a potential there also to, you know, market bamboo as a sustainable alternative to other products. And even plastic, for example, could be a great alternative to many products that nowadays are made from plastics. Yeah, even toilet paper. I've seen bamboo toilet paper, bamboo textiles, like you said. Um, but uh, for years, when I would go home to Hawaii, I would see beautiful bamboo wood and bamboo houses with bamboo flooring and everything like reuse of bamboo. And I'm uh, always thinking, but we have so much bamboo in Japan. Why aren't they using it like this? It's so cheap. It's so stylish. It's so sustainable. So I really encourage any entrepreneurs out there, get your bamboo businesses started. I love it. Uh, now, Simona, let's go back to uh, some of your rural revitalization ideas. Uh, one of your big topics is rural areas, places of possibility for sustainable futures. And I think we touched on this a little bit, but I was really interested in this research paper, the urban to rural lifestyle migrants, the in migration, you talk about it, like the migration from within Japan. Yes. And one of one of the women uh, talking about the safety net of living in the rural area. I love this story. She said, if you're in Tokyo, 
and you're struggling, uh, even if you don't have any money, there is nothing you can do. You just suffer. But if you're living in the rural area, your neighbors will give you vegetables or fruit and you can survive on 12,000 yen a month. I mean, the the need for money every day is just not as serious as if you're in an urban city center. And that's another big point of appeal, right? Yeah. And, you know, you can see from this from different perspectives as well, right? On one hand, it can be much cheaper to live in the countryside. So you can, you know, you can make a living without the kind of anxiety that comes from, you know, you're living in a city, you know, you have to pay your rent, your utilities, the food, the transportation. But then you can, and then you can also see it from a more like kind of sustainable lifestyle perspective. Like, you know, that you are, you can either grow your own food or probably if you live in a Japanese rural areas, your neighbors will give you a lot of food. That's something, that's a story I hear so much. Like, you know, I get too much food from the neighbors. I don't know what to do. I need, and I need to learn how to cook all of this stuff and process it because otherwise I don't know what to do with it. And also like, you know, the, possibilities of renting a house for really cheap often and then you can renovate or fix it up by yourself um, you also realize that your material needs are much lower than what you thought like for example you are in a city you have access to all these shops the supermarkets and you feel like the constant need to buy things because that's you know the the whole system is designed to get us to buy more stuff, especially stuff we don't need. But if you live in a rural areas, you're kind of removed from this environment. And then you realize, OK, I don't really need all this stuff. There are, you know, I have the few things that are essential for me to live. And then I can engage in creative pro projects that don't necessarily need money or a lot of resources to get started. I can use my creativity instead to do things. And, you know, that's something I, I think it's amazing about rural life, how you it can really change your mindset. And it can help us think about what is a sustainable lifestyle. And if we can get more people to get on board with these ideas, then we can probably create more sustainable rural communities as well, which is going to feed into, you know, the need for global change. Of course, you cannot you cannot solve global issues only through small local action, but it definitely it's a contribution and a change of mindset, a change of cultural values as well. And this feeds so beautifully into your concept of low carbon living, low impact living. Can you tell us a little bit about those ideas? Yeah, it's basically essentially what I was mentioning before, like how, well, we know from like global reports about climate change that we need to decrease our material consumption and i mean we as individual we need to uh, decrease our consumption but of course the whole system needs to change it's not just up to our individual like agency to change the world so the whole system needs to change but like also changing behaviors and lifestyle it's an important compo component of this and as I was mentioning, um, living in rural areas can help people to realize what is essential and so decrease and cut a lot of this non-essential consumption that is driving the climate change and biodiversity loss and degradation of ecosystem that we're seeing at a global level. I'm just showing some of your uh, pictures from your research. Can you talk about Kamiyama in Tokushima? Sure. So um, I visited Kamiyama in a couple of years ago, just before the, the, the start of the pandemic. I was at the in Kamiyama for two weeks. I was doing an internship there at the Food Hub project, which is um, one uh, project established within um, the city. And the focus of the Food Hub project is um, connecting food farming food and like eaters within the within the concept of a more like sustainable agri agriculture and food system so um the food hub is actually a, a pretty large scale project in the sense that um the people who are um, managing this project have are uh, acquiring farmland locally mainly abandoned farmland and they're doing 
growing a variety of vegetables and grains organically. For example, they have a local variety of wheat that they um, save. It was a kind of traditional variety that used to be uh, cultivated um, from like since like hundreds of years before. So they sort of revived this um, uh, wheat uh, cultivation and they're using the wheat they make to um, make bread and other products. They have a, their own bakery, they have a restaurant, they have an organic farm, um, and they have a lot of partnership both with local people and with people outside. So they have connection with Tokyo, but so the, so, and this is something very interesting about a lot of new projects that are happening in rural Japan. And I think in rural, in the rural countryside, in many parts of the world, like in Italy as well, you have this focus on local production, local consumption and local economies. But at the same time, you have these translocal connections that are often in the forms of, you know, um, knowledge sharing or um, partnerships. And that this connection can be even more like distance, like it's not just connected to the local area. So you have these restaurants in Tokyo or this um, kind of, um, supermarket in Tokyo selling their products or making or making dishes and selling them in the restaurants with their products and this again um, you know increases the knowledge about what the food hub is doing in Kamiyama and drives more people drive more interest drive more uh, engagement with this kind of projects and the food hub was also very interesting because uh, they have about if I remember correctly, around 30 employees now. And most of these people were actually newcomers who came to Kamiyama and to the food hub because they were interested in what they were doing. So through all these activities, you can also attract people to live in these smaller rural communities. Yeah, Kamiyama is a really exciting example. I haven't been there yet. I've been to Kamikatsu, uh, mm -hmm. the neighbor of Kamiyama the zero waste town many yeah. times. Um, but I really want to go to Kamiyama. It's been on my radar for a long time. I'd love to go and see all these wonderful sustainable initiatives they have. Mm -hmm. Isn't Kamiyama, is that near the uh, Japan's first earth ship as well? Is that I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, I, I think it's that same area. Something about Tokushima. There's a lot happening around Tokushima. It's a very exciting area. Um, so in Hiroshima, we're not too far from Shikoku. We can go to uh, Shikoku Island and, and explore and do projects there as well. Um, this low carbon meal, was this also in Kamiyama or where was this? This was actually when I did my, um, when I went woofing, it was uh, the, at the beginning of my research and I went to this farm in Mihara. It's close to Hiroshima. It's it's Sakamoto farm and this farm was is actually a very like it's a farm that was organic farm it was established I think around 30 years ago so Sakamoto-san was actually one of the pioneers of organic farming in uh, in Hiroshima prefecture and they had an amazing lifestyle in the sense that they were doing organic farming but they were also living an organic lifestyle like uh, they were heating their house and their bath with firewood. Um, they were using all natural products for cleaning. And they had these beautiful meals that were mainly vegetarian and vegan. So, and you like woofing with them. I think now they are retired. I'm not sure they do woofing anymore, although they still do farming with their family, but it was a really amazing experience to be there because you could really see how people you know, you're not just growing organic food, you're living an organic lifestyle. And that's also part of this like low carbon lifestyle, sustainable lifestyle idea. So that was really an uh, inspirational example. Wonderful. And then you had an example of natural dyeing. Is this uh, isome, indigo and cotton? Yeah. So um, this is actually in, in Saijo. Um, there's um, like a local... Um, Within the local sake brewery, there's a there's a, a woman. I think she's the wife. She's the wife of one of the sake brewer, and she does really amazing work with indigo, nat natural indigo. 
And I'm also inter very interested in indigo dyeing and in natural dyes and textiles. So, um, and I think many people now are rediscovering this, you know, this idea of natural dyes, natural materials. So, again, this this can actually can actually be another potential for things to do in rural areas. Like, for example, what if we use this abandoned farmland to grow more indigo, to grow more like fibers for making textiles. Like I, I remember when you interviewed Thomas, he mentioned about hemp and hemp as a textile, but also as a food source, like you can make oil, you can make a uh, flour with hemp seeds. Um, I'm talking about the, the one without the like psychoactive compounds, right? So, and hemp is such an amazing plant. Like it's, uh, it can decontaminate soils. It can you can make fibers out of it. You can make food. You can make a uh, building material. Like now you can make building blocks with hemp to build houses. So it's such an amazing product, and it's such a pity that there's so much kind of stigma around it. Like it's um, and hemp. Like it used to be grown so widely, both in Japan and Italy, for example, before as a, again maybe as mainly as a fiber. And now there's again this stigma around it and it's the it's forbidden to grow it or if you want to grow it you have so many legal loopholes and problems and again if we could use some of these abandoned farmland to grow these kind of crops we would do so much to make more sustainable like agriculture and food system create more local locally available jobs build rebuild local economies local supply chains so yeah, there's a lot of potential that could be definitely used more and give giving more value to this abandoned land as well would be quite important. That is so exciting. And I 100% I agree. Um, I am very excited about Isome, uh, indigo, natural indigo, because like hemp, it is one of the crops that is so easy to grow from what I've heard without any need for chemicals. Uh, when you are using indigo, it is completely non-toxic. It doesn't harm the person making it, using it as well. Uh, the after effect of using indigo, it can go naturally back into nature without causing any damage. It is a perfect circular agriculture and product we can use for making textiles, running businesses, but also for tourism as a workshop. There's so much appeal yeah. for Isome workshops, but we don't have enough natural Isome in Japan. I know Shikoku is starting to bring back these farms, but why aren't we growing this everywhere? Just like you yeah. said, because there is a high demand and there's not enough supply. So there's money to be made as well, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, we just have a few more minutes. Uh, Simona, is there anything we haven't talked about yet that you'd like to mention? I think that's probably, we, we touch upon so many things, I think. So many things. <laughs> that's enough. And I'm, again, I'm really excited for Saturday's event mm -hmm. as well, where we will have the chance to talk a little bit more about this topics yeah. and i'm really excited also to hear from the other speakers because there's such an amazing lineup of people who are going to participate in that event so really yeah, looking forward it's going to be a great event we're going to have so many great insights but also really fun uh, lots of great vegan food to enjoy that i'm bringing vegan and vegetarian food we're going to have tom's cafe scones in the morning and uh, vegan vegetarian food for lunch and lots of drinks and yeah just please uh buy your tickets last day to buy your tickets today so i'll put the link below after please join us <laughs> join us yeah uh this where is this picture at uh, this is also Kamiyama. There's a company who is making wood products out of local wood. Nice. And this one? This is actually our friend Andrew's uh, shop in uh, Naoshima. So okay. he's having a bookstore selling mainly art books. Then he sells art supplies. He's also planning to do events there, like art exhibitions. So this is Naoshima. 
Beautiful. Now, Naoshima, for people watching who might not know, is one of the famous art islands in Kagawa Prefecture, not far from Hiroshima. And this is, of course, Ushio chocolate on uh, Onomichi Mukaishima Island in yes. Hiroshima, right? Yes. And uh, Ushio is, is one of the few vegan chocolate companies in Japan. And they often use a lot of local produce. But one of the exciting things about the Ushio company is they really try to empower their women on staff as well. They used to have a great chocolate factory in Hiroshima Airport. I'm so sad that that closed. Um, but that was all women at that foo shop. That was wonderful. I really hope they have some support uh, to open that kind of chocolate factory somewhere else. Uh, how appealing is it to go to an airport and visit a chocolate factory? I love that. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, well, it's also very you. appealing to go to a kind of a, an, a small island and find this kind of amazing chocolate factory within an abandoned building. I think it was some kind of government building that was abandoned and it's like, great to see them reusing this building and having this kind of amazing creative yeah. like chocolate factory in it. So many connections to sustainability. They're using an old reused building, right? An old abandoned building. Uh, their designers as well are all women that they get for the product design. Uh, they promote women in the workplace. Everything's vegan. So there's a lot less carbon in having vegan products. Uh, better for the environment. Uh, thank you so much, Simona. So many wonderful things we've talked about. And I'm so excited to learn more on Saturday. Okay, thanks for having me and looking forward to Saturday. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And that is our, our last talk of this week. I'm going to Tokyo next week. Um, so we might have some talks when I come back at the end of next week from the 19th. So please join us again then. Take care, everyone. Hopefully see you on Saturday. Please sign up. Take care. Bye. Take care. Thanks, Bye. everybody, for joining. Thank you.